He did, okay. <laughs> what we talked Love, love, uh, love, love, love. I don't know, you know, um, as you're going to see in, in these first uh, episodes, Odo goes into a very dark place and um, is essentially lost to everyone because he is seduced back into the link by the female shapeshifter. And uh, so the relationship with Kira totally disintegrates. I mean, falls apart in the worst possible way. She completely, she feels completely betrayed by him, which she is. He betrays everyone. He doesn't do it because he wants to betray them. He, is, he, loses, he loses himself. <clears throat> they manage to sort of patch it up in 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 the wedding episode when when uh, Kira and Worf get married. The other beautiful woman. The other beautiful woman. So uh, he he manages to patch it up there, uh, or they manage to patch it up. And um, but right now, for instance, the episode we're shooting this week, she is completely uh, involved with this the the crossover character of the Vedek of uh, Philip Anglum. So I never know what they're going to do with this relationship, and frankly, I don't uh, I don't want to know. This it, it and that's just me. There are some actors. Nana, for instance, who really like to know as far ahead of time as they can what is going to be happening to their character. That is important to them in, the, in their work, in the way they develop their character. For me, and that I accept and I think is a perfectly legitimate way of working, for me, I, um, I figure if the character doesn't know, why should I know? And it's fun for me to open the script each week and be surprised by the challenges that come. So I really don't know. And, and Ira loves to tell us. He loves to say, oh, this is going to happen. And I always go, Ira, don't tell me about it. Because A, when you tell me about it, I imagine one thing, and then you write something else anyway. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's better not to, not to get it, not to do that. So I don't, I, this is a very long-winded, I don't know. <laughs> There you go. I'm going to go all the way to the back. And then I, you, I owe you one. You've been. Hi, Debbie. Um, I'm just curious. I, I really enjoy the interaction between Odo and Thomas Roy. Are there any plans to work to bring her back once all the dark stuff gets over with? Again, you know, these, these, the questions about what will happen, I'm very, very bad about answering. Because I think this is a kind of a special, uh, it's, and I'm not blowing smoke here, this is a more sort of intimate and probably savvy group. I wouldn't get into conversations like this. Uh, I, to tell you the, is this good? Mm. <laughs> I uh, love working with Majel, but there, they have a problem writing stories for her. They, they, they haven't, and, and, they're, and they're very resistant, and I think that's right. They resist just writing some story so they can get Loxana Troy into the season. So how long has it been since she, she wasn't in last season? The season before. So, I mean, I would be amazed if we went another season without her character, which would be, and it would be a pity. Huh? We're married, yeah. But we know that marriage is not a real, not a real marriage. Um, I just can't believe that she's not, they're not going to find a story. I think the reason last year was because she was, um, uh, she was busy producing... Yeah, Battle Earth Final Conflict. What's it called? Earth Final Conflict. Earth Final Conflict, Earth Final Conflict Battleground Earth, there are yeah. different names for it, which I've seen, have you seen the little promo for it? Is, it's not airing yet, is it? Not yet. No. So that looks like fun, and, but I think she's deeply involved in that. <clears throat> and she's probably deeply involved in, in, in taking the wheelbarrows full of money that come, from <laughs> <laughs> that come from this brilliant Star Trek. You're going like that, yes. Yeah, probably not as much as she deserves because the great Ferengi Paramount is uh, <laughs> a 
I told him it's blind. <laughs> um, but uh, so I, I, uh, I would be disappointed if she didn't come back. It's, I, uh, I love her dearly. She's a wonderful spirit, and um, and and she's very important to the whole. Franchise. The franchise. Well, I was going to use that word, franchise, but then I realized that's not what I meant. That's franchise is a word that really does describe Star Trek, but I was thinking of it more in terms of the the mythos, the history of of Star Trek. You know, when we talk about the Tribbles episode, and I'm sort of I'm diverging here, but um, huh? It's, it's, if it was just repeated, it's going to be on. Today. It's going to be on again. Now, I know that this is an extraordinary episode. For me, what was fun, that, I'm going to horrify people, I know, but <laughs> when we were getting ready to do that episode, I was in the makeup trailer one, uh, one night taking off the makeup, and it just happened to be on the air, the real, the original. Yeah, well, and I watched wow. it, and you know, it, it was funny, and, but it was also clunky and weird looking and, <laughs> and, and I say to people when we're walking on our sets in our wonderful snazzy costumes and everything I say we would be arrogant fools if we didn't think that in 30 years we're going to look clunky and funny we're, all we can hope is that our stories will still have resonance the way the original stories do so all that being said I found the Tribbles episode sort of really fun, but sort of lightweight. It didn't really, wasn't. And I thought, we're going to go to all this trouble to, to inject ourselves into this sort of silly little story when there are great episodes. But that was very clever of them to do uh, as writers. You know, it's like there's a, there's a sort of a rule of thumb. It's very <coughs> stupid to remake a great movie uh, it's better to remake a B movie that didn't quite make it, but that had a good story. Because uh, when you ma remake a great movie, you're you're fiddling around with greatness. And so, if we had gone into one of the great Star Trek episodes, although Tribbles is a very famous one, th that would have been foolish. That would have been screwing around with something that you shouldn't. Th that was had its own perfection to it. But to go into Tribbles was great. And I don't know why I got over this, but the, the whole thing about being part of history, that's from Majel into that, that's what, for me, was great about the Tribbles episode, was to be part of the history of an art form, that television is, you know, in, 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 in this century, in the 20th century, Centuries from now, television will be some antiquated, some quaint thing that we look at and talk about, but it will be a very important part of, of the art, of the cultural, whatever. I'm not articulating that very well. But so to be, be able to go back and be part of the beginning of television, really. Television is not a very old form anyway. So what is it, 50 years? So to be able to go 30 years back into it and be part of that was, I thought, sort of magical and wonderful, above and beyond the magic of the special effects, which were extraordinary, and all that work that they did. That, oh, anyway, I owe you. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning, when you auditioned for Odo. I mean, were you up for the part of Odo? Because I was thinking, the first season, definitely, when I was watching it, I was thinking, God, they should have, you know, they should be playing Dax. Because you have the all that history and all that experience to play seven different lifetimes. But I don't have the breasts. <laughs> 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 it's really what they were interested in. <laughs> I should be playing Dax. In drag? No. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, <laughs> so I, was, did, I mean, when you went into audition, was that... Oh, was I up for that part? or? Well, no, I wasn't up. I, was I up for Odo, or was I ever considered for any yeah, other parts? Else, yeah. No, I was lucky that they would even that I even got in the door the first time for Odo, because it was not the way the character was described in the cast breakdowns that were sent out. I didn't see them, but I know that what they were really looking for was uh, Michael Pillar's vision of Odo was a young John Wayne. That was what, that's what, what he can see that. And you go, ooh, but the right guy doing it, person doing it, would have 
made it work. That's, that was his writer's vision of it. But because the character was so amorphous and, and because the one description of him in the script was he has an oddly unfinished face, which God knows nobody ever described my face as being. <laughs> um, uh, because of that, it left Junie Lowry, it gave Junie Lowry the chance to do what really wonderful casting directors do when they're, they, they sit and talk to the writer, director, producers, and they, get, and, and they get feedback about what they think, what kind of actors they want to see for a certain role. And, um, and, and then a good casting director goes out and, and brings, they have an incredible encyclopedic knowledge of all the actors out there, and they bring in actors who seem to fit that. And then a good casting director will throw in wild cards, like a clinker, like something, because if, if you sit there all day seeing, you know, we want to see beautiful five foot, Ten blondes, um, and they bring them in. You know, they and you sit there all day, and you see twenty of them. They all begin to look the same, and you can't even make. You know, you go, well, I mean, and I know this. I've been in these casting sessions. Well, a good casting director brings in the wild card to sort of make them go, oh, maybe, maybe the character could be played that way. And I was lucky enough to be one of those wild cards. And I was, I've told this story a million times, but I was sitting out in the hallway waiting to go in to meet them and I knew that I was not right for the character the way they were conceiving it which is a great uh, it's a great relief when you know you're not right for a character when you think you're right for a character it, the responsibility that it's a, when I was a kid I knew that I was not going to pass the geometry test I knew that was not in question, so I was very relaxed when I went in to take it. <laughs> the history and the English tests, which I knew I should ace, I was nervous about. So I wasn't really particularly nervous about going in. I mean, I'm, you don't like to go, you know, I'm a shy person. I know that seems weird sitting up here, but I am. <laughs> and sitting in a hallway for 45 minutes to go in to meet a whole bunch of people that I've never met before. and perform for them something that so you know there's a certain heightened thing that happens but uh, but I wasn't really nervous because I didn't think there was a much of a shot so I just sort of went in and as I've said I've told the story before as I was walking through the door Ron Surma turned to me and he said nobody has been grouchy enough <laughs> he was talking about the other actors that have gone in He's, no one's been grouchy enough and that sort of went into my little computer and I walked in and I, in fact, I was so grouchy <laughs> that uh, David Carson later told me that they liked me. They liked what I did because it was so, I could tell because the first line, it was a line to Quark. And of course, Armin wasn't there. Ron Surma, the casting guy, was reading Armin's lines, Quark's lines. And this, this growl came out. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I went through it and I left. And, and David said, after that, they said, well, that was interesting. <laughs> Actually, from that moment, Rick Berman was, wanted me for the part. I had to come back four more times to oh, convince him. But, uh, but Rick was in my camp, which is pretty, pretty good. I mean, you know, that was, that was about as close to getting it as you could, but I still had to keep coming back. But one of the things that they wanted to check was, is he really that, is he going to be difficult to work with? Because yeah. uh, I, I was so grouchy, and I was grouchy, I wasn't grouchy, I just was very deadpan. If I wasn't doing the lines, I was just, you know, <laughs> sitting there. So, Dax. That, you know, one of the, th the thing is, anybody could have played Odo. Not anybody could have played it, but Odo could have been played by a woman, could have been played by somebody of any race, any color, any age. could have been any age, exactly. It could have um, been a series of guest stars, many people playing Odo. Many people could play Odo. Yeah. What a horrible thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, the, and the same is true of Dax. And that is a wonderful thing about those characters. That's a, 
I hadn't actually ever really thought about that, how, how rich that is and how, w what a clear illustration it is of how fascinating those characters are that anybody could play them. Um, that, that they have so many levels. Uh, it's, with my new infatuation with the computer, well, the first thing I've discovered is that it seems to have all these levels go, you know, that I'm looking at something flat, but my sense is that it really goes into somewhere that I can't even imagine that it goes You're anyway. with it. Huh? <laughs> 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 okay, enough of that. Yes. You. Oh, hi, my name is Eva. Um, is that going to be a test on all these names? <laughs> 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 yes. That's a great <laughs> idea. But if he remembers any of your names. <laughs> 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 I have two questions. One is, do the writers ever ask you what you'd like to see all those over what you'd like to do with the character? And two, given your multifaceted career, is there a role that you haven't played that you would absolutely love to play? Uh, no and yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't ask. Uh, they don't ask. And the one time I sort of suggested. sort of suggested what I was interested in, it was the beginning of the. Uh, the beginning of the season. Where I where I found first found the 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 other shapeshifters the beginning of the third season yeah, third season. they took me out to lunch Ira and and Michael because they knew that um uh, they had heard that I said at conventions when people would ask me when are we going to find out where Odo is from uh, my answer was always the day we find out where Odo is from is the day they're writing me out of the show. And they took me out to lunch <laughs> to tell me they were going to find out where we were going to find out where, and to assure me that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and in the course of the lunch, as we talked about ideas and things, I said, you know, uh, I've always, I've always been interested in Odo being able to morph into other things besides animals, birds, inanimate objects. I would like to morph into another um, another humanoid, and they said, "Oh, we're not. We don't want to go there with that. We don't want to. We don't want to get into that." So they never really have. The closest they've gotten to it is the uh, Curzon Dax, at yeah. where which is really uh, bringing it together, and and I've always wanted him to come back that character, but I've heard via the grapevine, and maybe I heard it from one of you guys, uh, no, I've heard it, actually I heard it through Cliff Bowles, the guy who directed that episode, that Ira didn't like that episode. Aww. So do a little work. <laughs> However, you got, you got Philip Anglum back, <laughs> get Curzon Dax back, because I think he's a great character. It wasn't that he didn't like the character of Curzon Dax, he didn't like the episode. And you know what happens? with a thing like that is, and he wrote it, so, you know, or he was <laughs> producing it, and um, so when something like that happens is it's not, you lose your perspective. It's not that you don't like something, you, you, you just sort of go, oh, no, that didn't, I wasn't happy there, so you don't go there anymore. You, and so they haven't done that, but anyway, I've always wanted to do other characters. I'd love to play, uh, and I think it's ironic that a, I'm a character actor, and I spent all my life playing very different kinds of characters. Uh, I just think, and, and, and I'm playing a, an, a character who can morph into other things. It's ironic to me that actually um, other people in the cast have gotten to be different, different like uh, Kira has gotten to be a Cardassian, you know, and I've never got, I've gotten to be a Klingon. But that wasn't even that I got to morph it, because at the time I got to be a Klingon, I didn't have my shape-shifting powers. It was surgically done. So they don't really want me to do that. I, I, you, you guys have asked, so well, if nobody else, go ahead. Well, I'll get to you then, and I'll get to you, I'll get to you. Well, basically, one of my favorite uh, scenes uh, you played was when you were playing to, I think, 
think it was orange jello and motor oil. <laughs> 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 yeah. did, um, uh, well, that was basically one of my favorite scenes. But is there? But do you have is, a question? <laughs> is there any particular actor you would love to work with, and which you have not yet worked with? Actor. Okay, and I didn't finish the question about what, is there a role I don't have to play? Right. Okay, well, well they, they sort of come together. Actor I haven't worked with who I would love to work with. Ah, uh, there's so many actors. Sean Penn, Robert De Niro, mm -hmm. um, Marcello Mastroianni, who is no longer with us, was the greatest film actor. Uh, I think of all time, uh, Toshiro Mifuni. I know these are weird, <laughs> but these are actors that I admire. Um, those are all men. There are women, you know, Meryl Streep. Uh, oh, there are just so many wonderful actors in the world who I would love to be able to <coughs> be in the same creative space with and, and absorb how they work and, and, and communicate with uh, on, a, on a creative level. Um, roles that I would love to play, well, I, when I was 25 years old and starting the American Conservatory Theater a repertory company, I played King Lear. I played Lear. Um, and that was, you know, sort of a cosmic joke because, you know, to play one of the greatest roles in English literature uh, as a 25-year-old when it's really a, you know, a man at the end of his life, um, I knew at the time that it was, you know, that it was a challenge that I had to meet, but that I would know <coughs> that it, there was no chance that I was going to actually succeed at it. Or succeed isn't the word because you can't fail. All you have to do is memorize Shakespeare, and you've already achieved something wonderful. Um, but I would like to play Lear again as I approach the age that he actually is. One of the complex things about Lear is that when you are young enough to physically do it, because it's a physically tremendously demanding role, vocally and physically, when you're young enough to do it, you're not old enough to understand it. And when you're old enough to understand it, you're not, you're not young enough to physically do it. So you have to choose the exact time. <laughs> Jump in there and get it right at the right time. So I hope that will happen. Uh, but that would, be, that would be the role. Yes, and I promised you. Wait a minute, let me go there first. Cause you, thanks. Hi. Oh. Okay, back uh, to you. Yes, um, I've noticed in re-watching the first season episodes uh, now that Odo sounds different in first season. He does, than, doesn't than he? he does, yeah. does now. And I wonder how the voice characterization evolved and what went into your mind in evolving that voice characterization and how it goes. Well, he not only he, he not only sounds different, he looks different, too. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But that we understand because when it began, it was a whole bunch of little pieces, actually. And I was the one who argued to get it to be a mask, to be a full piece. Uh, the truth is, I thought I was doing in the first season. I hear, I hear it now when I hear old episodes. Or if you had asked me what I was doing in the first season, I thought I was doing what I'm doing now. Maybe it's because I'm five years older. Maybe it's because. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I have, I can't, I have, I'm very uncomfortable doing Odo's voice out of makeup. I mean, I can, I can't do it. It's weird. I mean, it, it feels phony when I do it. And, and you know, um, I thought I was, it was that deep and that it, that he talked that, but he wasn't really. He was a little higher and a little, I guess I wasn't, uh, I, I, I wasn't uh, taking the chance. It was too risky. Well, especially because, because I have trouble doing it in front of you out of makeup. Um, it's, uh, yeah. 
when it started, I guess I was scared to go as far with the voice as I really wanted to because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to be consistent with it. So I gradually moved into it. But any television series you watch that runs over a number of years, if you go back and watch original early episodes, it doesn't matter whether it's Taxi or Friends or VR or anything. You watch this thing that happens as the, the characters, the actors, it's an organic process and they're growing older, growing more mature, growing with the character, uh, getting gaining confidence, getting sometimes uh, really uh, resorting to tricks to, to sort of to make their work easier. But that's not what I'm talking about in terms of Odo. Uh, the voice, I guess I got more confident in it. And it's, my sense is it's just gotten more growly and uh, it's sort of deeper. A little sort of piece of trivia. When, whenever they say, you know, the process of beginning a shot, of, of, of doing a shot, is you stand on your marks and they're getting ready to do it and they, uh, the AD says, uh, put us on a bell, and uh, the sound man sitting at the sound cart, he has that switch, <coughs> and he pushes some button, and you hear and the red light starts blinking outside, and that means no one can come in or go out. Can't open the doors while the red light is blinking after there's been the bell. So the bell, and then, um, the sound man turns on the, the tape and the tape starts rolling and once the tape gets up to speed, he says, speed, to tell the cameraman that if he's ready, the cameraman turns on the camera, the, the guy with the board, with the clap, I know what that is. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what he's called, what his job is called. He's not a gaffer, no. No. Not best boy either. <laughs> anyway, he's a camera assistant we see all of some these, kind. These credits are all yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, but anyway, he does the, the clapper to identify it, uh, and um, <coughs> the cameraman might say set or ready, you know, to let the director know that everything's ready to go, and the director says action. As the clacker, or the clapper is going. This is the trivia I was going to get to. Well, that's trivia too, but uh, as the clapper is going, I, I have this almost, it's like a tick now. As the clapper is going, I go, <clears throat> can you hear that? I'm, <clears throat> yeah. and, I, and I find the place for Odo's voice. And I go, <clears throat> <clears throat> and then I start talking. And then, then the voice comes out. And I still can't do it. It has to be real lines. And I, have to be, I have to be in makeup, although it's not when I record the books, I, I, I don't have any trouble. But it's uh, because I, 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 I don't have lines. You know, it's like, it's as if I'm, part of acting for me is a, is, a, is a magic trick. I know that I'm trying to get a whole bunch of people to believe that I am something that I'm not. And just like a magic trick, I, I, I'm uncomfortable showing a mag how, a, how I do a magic trick. I, it, it's as if, I, as if you were standing behind me as I was doing sleight of hand so you could see how I'm doing it. And so I don't like to, it seems sort of, so if I'm, even if I'm recording a book and I'm not actually in Yodo makeup, because I'm recording the book, I get in, I'm like, so much of acting is being a child anyway and being willing to suspend your disbelief. And you remember when you were a child and you would say, okay, now I'm the guy who runs the garage and you drive up and I'll give you the gasoline and we'll, and then you go into it and you could actually get into these incredibly long involved fantasy games where you could drop out of them for a second and say, no, 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 don't do that, because you did it. But then you'd get right back into the character. Well, that's all acting is, really, is being willing to do that in front of a camera or in front of an audience. And, and just as kids might get self-conscious if 
you suddenly, you know, came and sat down and said, go ahead, play in front of me, play. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't be comfortable. And I'm not particularly comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have a question about this director's training. You had to go to um, the Paramount, or I don't know exactly how it goes. Um, so you could actually direct episodes for stuff. How did this all start out? I mean, because usually I, I would say those actors when they're not thinking on the set, they like watching if they yeah, I wish I wish Andy were here too, also because I'd love to hear him address that question as well. Uh, the I you know I went to Rick and I said I would like to become a director in training. I didn't even have the courage to say I actually want to direct. But I said I would like to become a director in training because I knew, because Avery had done it, and uh, uh, Jonathan Frakes, of course, had talked to me about it, and I knew LeVar was beginning to do it, and I knew that people had done it. And, and so I knew that, unlike a lot of television shows where they let actors direct, I mean, on Dallas or, you know, whenever you see Match. that, uh, yeah, that, that a, well, it, it may be different, probably different for when Alan uh, yeah. did it, but, but usually when a regular character directs on the television series, they don't go through any training process. It's just, no, it's just assumed that the director of photography Jonathan West, in our case, or Marvin Rush, will sort of take you under his or her wing and basically do all the stuff. And, and the actor or director will talk to the other actors about interpretation and will act as a director in the sense of interpretation rather than really getting into the technical aspects of directing. That's how it usually is. but. One of the great things about Star Trek is that they put you into this director in training situation. As I've said, that's what uh, uh, David Livingston says, director in training, that means you're a dick. <laughs> <laughs>
to, I have to, because when he says cut, everything stops and I have to cut it there when I really needed a few more frames of, of Kira watching Odo walk out the door. Now I'm forced to cut immediately to either Odo walking out the door or the scene is over there. Or, so if he had let me, if he had let the film cut, go on a little longer so you learn about that and you learn, oh, you see here he, he neglected, he should have had that character, that character walked out of the shot at that point and then leaves the room and you've either got to show me them leaving the room or you should have had him cross in behind in the other shot so we know where the character went because if you don't do that then the character just disappears, pops out of sight. Or you, and you start to learn all those little tricks. So you spend hours in the editing room because that's really where you learn what they need because ha filmmaking, as miraculous as it is, is still like, it's still a very handmade process. It's still taking all these little tiny pictures that's, and you take, and you have to start weaving them together and cutting them together. It gets technically easier because it can be done in a computer and all that stuff, but it's still like making something on a loom. You're still weaving images together to make a story, and so you have to learn all of that. In my case, at one point I was in a sound session, and Rick was there, and I was just sort of sitting there like a fly on the wall and being a good boy and not saying anything. And the sound session was over, and Rick turned and looked at me, and he said, are, are you, oh no. He said, are you, you're walking out to the car? And I said, yeah. So we walked out to the car together, and he said, as we got towards the car, he said, are you ready? And I went, <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't think so yet. No, I think I need a, uh, no. <laughs> and he said, all right. And, uh, and then uh, about two weeks later, he called, and he said, this is the call you love to get and you hate to get. <laughs> and I said, well, what? <laughs> he's not even going to fire me. <laughs> and he said, you're on. You got to go. You got to do it. So I did. So I started. And, uh, uh, and I'm still a director in training. I still, you know, I know I'm going to start prep in a few, a week or two, two weeks or something. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm, and I and I there's part of me that just fills up with dread at the at the idea that I'm gonna and I but then I talk to Alan Craker, one of our you know best directors, incredibly experienced man, and uh, and I said we were talking I don't know and I said you know when I get the script the first time I'm in shock I sit there looking at it going what what how am I gonna do that how am I gonna oh my God how does that happen how can you do that and he said. I do that too. <laughs> you just do, and then you relax and you start reading it. And uh, because for me, I've done six episodes, and the first one was magical, and everything seemed to work wonderfully. And because I was really being supported and protected, and they were just sort of, you know, you couldn't really screw it up. And and then the second one was a little more problematic. It was a little, little tricky. The third one. It turned out all right, but it was a disaster. I mean, I just, it was the um, Hippocratic Oath. It was like uh, Cullum and Sid were being naughty, and, <laughs> and, and, and the set was a mess. They didn't give us enough room, and so Jonathan West was furious that, that the set designers, that he couldn't get the angles he wanted, and the, and the Jem Hadar all looked exactly the same. <laughs> there were a whole bunch of them, so you'd have scenes and you'd go, well, which one is that? You know, I, they, they've since tried to fix that, but that was the episode where we learned that they all looked exactly the same, so if you had more than three of them there, you didn't know who was talking, unless the, oh, boy. <laughs> which one is talking? Uh, and so it was a mess, and I came out of it like, uh, I think you were you were there while we. I was like in shock during it. It was like, oh, well, help me. <laughs> and, and then the next one, Sid was a saint, and, and it was uh, it was the quickening, and it was, and it was on location with the biggest set they'd ever built for a Star Trek episode, uh, with seventy five extras, and the set was destroyed by the rain 
uh, and then they had to rebuild it all, so they had to change the schedule around, and that one went like magic. And then the one after that was a disaster. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, and then the next one after that was great. So I'm, I don't know which is going to be, you know, you never seem to, I'm hoping it's going to get a little easier as it goes along. Yes. Tell us some more about Coleman and Sid being naughty. Yeah. <laughs> you want to know about that? Because you're going to ask him about that tomorrow. <laughs> well, uh, it, you know, I mean, what to say? I don't know. They were just, it was my third episode, so they didn't feel, I mean, I'm speaking for him now, and he probably, you know, Ed is, Ed, Ed, uh, Sid is fa fabulous. <laughs> it, it, I, it was in the quickening at one point. Um, uh, I was trying to get him to do something, and he wouldn't do it. And he didn't think it was right. He didn't think it was the right thing to do. And so he was like doing it the way he felt. And we kept doing it again and again and again. And um, I kept sort of trying to get him to do it. And, he would. and of course, my the previous episode had been with him also, in which he had been naughty. And I think he would acknowledge that. He's actually said that. I've read that in interviews. I don't know whether he were, used the word naughty, but he talked about being sort of impossible, being, being <laughs> difficult. And um, so I was still sort of like, you know, these are, these are like family members. You have to understand that it's sort of like siblings. You, you know, you can, you can get away with a lot more grouchiness and being, being naughty or being whatever you are. So he, was, he wasn't doing this. So I said, Sid, let's go outside. We walked outside off the stage. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I started like carrying on it. And he just went. He looked at me like I was from Mars. And, and you know, he's so, so understated and so British, really. And so reserved. It was sort of like, well, I really, I. You know, and he walked back inside and he did it. Fine. It was fine. I don't. I don't know whether he did it the way I wanted it, or whether all I needed to do was have a little blow up, and then he <laughs> sort of went back in and did it. And I went, oh, that's okay, good. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, you know, we all have the capacity to be naughty uh, for a myriad different reasons. You know, whether it's in Cullen's case, it was that he really was about to leave to do a feature film and. So he wasn't there anymore, really. He was out the door. And he, all he basically wanted to do was get the episode over and get on with something else. And, or in this particular instance, it was really because putting Sid and Cullum together is like putting Armin and Renee together. You know, the first season, <laughs> Armin and I, our makeup chairs were next to each other. By the next season, it was like being in first grade where you're separated from the. <laughs> We're on opposite ends of the trailer now. And Sid and Cullum are that way, too. You know, they're, they're good buddies. They're very relaxed with each other. And so they could, it was easy for them to sort of not be concentrated or focused or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's all I have to say about that, if that's enough. Because I'm sure when Sid gets here, you'll ask him about it. <laughs> yes? Uh, earlier, uh, Rand, or Andy uh, shared with us quite a, a good story about his most embarrassing moment as an actor. And uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us a pretty good story about your moment. Question about the most embarrassing moment as an actor. These are the questions that stymie me totally. I'm amazed that he could remember something. Uh, the someone says the most. <laughs> what? Oh, I don't know. There have been so many embarrassing moments in my life. You know, when I, what actually what's coming to, to mind right away was the last time <coughs> I was on Broadway. Um, I was doing a musical, A City of Angels, and um, we were in previews. Previews are a very uh, tumultuous period of time especially in a in a musical because it's like a it's a huge mechanism that is rolling forward <coughs> but there's a lot of tweaking and fixing and repairing that has to be done 
to make it technically work. That particular show, um, the stage manager had more calls, had to make more calls than they make to launch the shuttle at NASA. <laughs> and he, had, he had more, he was calling light cues, sound cues, orchestra cues, it was unbelievable. So that had to be fixed. Certain songs weren't working, certain lines weren't working, scenes. Uh, and it's a Broadway show, and there's a huge audience out there, full orchestra in the pit. And I had a very difficult number to sing. It was not, never actually was a very, uh, they never really solved the problem with it. It was musically not very interesting. It was lyrically incredibly difficult. And it changed rhythms all the time throughout it. <coughs> and um, one of the things that they wanted to do to fix it was they wanted to take the third verse and make it the first verse <laughs> and, take and, and move the verses around so that they were all jiggled around like that. And um, so we rehearsed it a couple of times. Thanks. We rehearsed it a couple of times. Whoa. <laughs> and, uh, in the afternoon. And I put it in that night. And it went fine. It worked fine. It's where it, uh, <coughs> it started with something like, I've got six, uh, six nominations. Anyway, I can't even remember it anymore. But anyway, so I did, I did it and it worked fine because I was so hyped for it. And the next day it worked fine. And the next day it worked fine. And then I relaxed. <laughs> and then I started, I got up and I, you know, it's on a Broadway stage, the orchestra's there, the conductor goes like this, and I start my song, and I'm going like this, and I'm singing, and I look down at the pit, and the conductor is going. And he starts shouting the, new, the other lyrics to me, as if I'm going to sort of be singing A, B, C, D, D, F, G, K, L, A, as if I'm going to jump in the middle to a new rhythm. And I just went. <laughs> and, the, and the orchestra sort of ground to a <laughs> And I said, uh, let's try this again. <laughs> and I went around back and, um, and, he st and I said, maestro. And he started the or orchestra again. And uh, when I said that, let's try this again. Or let's get this right, I said. Let's get this right. Now, what you have to know is that the character was a control freak. And the audi audience already knew that the character was a control freak. So they thought that it was, it was an incredible in-joke that the <laughs> idea would turn and, and, and try to control the orchestra. So they roared with laughter. <laughs> and I went back and I said, maestro, and we did it. And I was like in shock. And I went through the rest of the show. And afterwards, everybody said, that was amazing. How did you do that? Larry Gelbart came back and said, unbelievable. <laughs> and I was going, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I got into bed and I was like, <laughs> it was like I'd been in a, in a car accident. Actually, that's not an embarrassing moment. That's a, that's a patting myself on the back. Moment I got away with <laughs> My most embarrassing moment was when I was a 16-year-old kid and I went to Stratford, Connecticut to be an apprentice. John Houseman was a dear friend of the family's and a mentor of mine. I later worked for him at Juilliard and uh, uh, just since I was a kid, I'd known him. And I was 16 years old, and he invited me to come up to, to be an apprentice there. But because I was in school, I couldn't come up for the beginning of the season. I came up. They'd already been running for two weeks. And I replaced uh, another actor who left. But I was just um, a, a walk-on. I was an extra. And I was this gangly 16-year-old kid. And it was my first. I got up in the afternoon, and they put me on that night in, in, into the show. It was King John. Uh, with Fritz Weaver and John Emery and Nina Foch in starring roles. And they put they sent me down to costumes and I got into this uniform, a guard. I was playing a guard. And I was 16 years old. I was very skinny. And, um, and the costume was fisherman's boots that came up to here. <laughs> covered in um, 
burlap that was painted silver to look like armor with big curtain rings stuck all over it that were also painted silver. So I was in these big fisherman boots that were sort of blah, 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 blah. and then a big sort of overcoat thing that also had these curtain rings on it and a huge helmet that sort of came down here like this. And I had a big spear. And I would go stand next to the stage manager and he would say, all right, when this scene is over, what you do is you, you, you'll follow the rest of those guys over there and you walk and you just stand at the back of the stage and then come back to me when it's done. You'll walk off, you follow them all. So I would go stand in, in the dark and the lights would go out for that scene and then I would follow the guys out and so boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and I would follow the guys out and I would stand there and, and I would stand there with my sphere and I would watch the scene happen in front of me and it was very exciting and interesting and then they would turn to leave and I'd go, oh, we can I'd follow them. <laughs> Then I'd go back to the stage and say, okay, in this one, you just have to walk diagonally across the stage, follow the rest of the guys there. So I follow, follow the rest of the guys. And, and I kept coming back to him. He'd go, yeah, okay, and then this one. And he was getting a little confused too, but he said, okay, then this one, you just go out there and you stand you stand um, just to the right of the thing and something. So I went, I went walking, walking out and um, the lights, it was sort of dark and then the lights came up and I was standing there and I had this sense that something was wrong. <laughs> Very quiet, and I, I sort of turned, and I looked, and there was a throne right next to me, and John Emery, the star, King John, was about to do a soliloquy all by himself. And it was, <laughs> just me and him. <laughs> off stage to the stage manager and the stage manager was going <laughs> <laughs> the set was made up of slats like Venetian blinds that they raised and lowered and because he was the only person on stage they had lowered the thing so I sort of looked at him and I started off the stage. <laughs> and my spear gets caught in the set. <laughs> and I'm looking to him King John is sitting there <laughs> Looking and the stage manager is going dead. <laughs> that was that was I was 16 years old and that was my first time on the professional stage. And <laughs> it doesn't bode well. <laughs> All right, enough. Yes. Um, back to Odo. Um, in the second season, Shadow Play, where Odo connected with the little girl Taya. Yeah. <laughs> I see when it like, and he turned into the top. Uh -huh. like, how did that feel to you to be so different as Odo and to be nurturing? And well, that was all part of the process of discovering the character. And um, <clears throat> actually, it was an aspect of Odo that uh, I was really pleased that they were addressing it. Um, it had already been hinted at in another episode with a l where, where I take that scoundrel character to find his little girl. Vortex. Yeah. Vortex. Vortex, is that what it's called? Yeah. And then it's, it is actually a, you know, it's, it's been carried on. I mean, in fact, with the, when you talked about talking to the, the blob of jello and motor oil or whatever that was. <laughs> That's, that's a continuation of that aspect, aspect of Odo's character, which is what I've always loved about the character, that there, is, there's, there are all these different layers to him, that on, one, on the one hand, he can seem so cold and rigid and, and unflexible, and then on the other hand, he has, is capable of tremendous warmth. Um, and that was the first, uh, that was the, one of the strongest, the beginning of that aspect of it. I loved, I loved doing it. Um, you know, Andy was talking about having the flu. I had the flu during that episode. Well, I had the flu when I came back to do the blue screen of spinning. And, and I, you know, uh, they put me into the makeup. I could hardly walk. Uh, and and then I had to just go stand on the stage in front of a blue screen and spin and spin oh, and spin. Oh. Uh, I thought I was going <laughs> to be like a jamba juice or something. 
Renee, yes. Renee, How we do? Have to be the last one. This is the last one. The last one. Yeah. Sid and Michael uh, both directed their first episodes during the first season. Yeah. Was there any time with any advice you gave Sid or Michael, or did they come to you for advice? Or, and who was your uh, teacher? Did you watch Avery? Did he give you advice? Well, you. It's always interesting to watch. Um, new directors. Um, in fact, Andy followed me around uh, when I was doing the quickening. And I, and as I said to him at the time, I said, it's really, you know, it, he, he, he also spent a lot of time with, with seasoned directors. But it, it is very good to be with unseasoned directors because, A, it it gives you confidence in your, you know, you, you realize that you don't have to know everything, you, it, that you're going to learn it as it goes along. But it, it, you also, it's always good to watch someone who doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> because you can, you can learn a lot that way, because you, you, uh, you know, it's obvious. So um, I, I didn't give them advice, and I not even, I'm sure. We talked, and I can't, I can't, couldn't honestly tell you. Um, mostly what you do when, when someone is about to direct for the first time is you just try to make them comfortable with the fact that everyone's going to support you and that, you know, that you should just trust your own instincts. And, um, you know, I would, I would never presume to give Michael Dorn advice. He's been doing the show for 10 years, you know. He, he knows the show inside out. He was so completely relaxed about it. He, you know, he just, because he's an airplane, you know, he flies a jet. The guy, I figure anybody who can fly a jet can direct it. You know. <laughs> uh, so uh, I didn't, didn't give them advice, really. They just, um, they're both incredibly capable people who had and, and Sid particularly. See, I don't, I don't really think Michael's interested in directing. I think he, I don't mean to speak for him, but I think he, he did it because it was an option that he could exercise because they wanted him to come on our show. And I have a feeling he said, yeah, I'll do it if you let me direct. You know, I don't know if he's going to direct this season or not. I haven't heard. Um, but Sid really is a director. I believe that, and this you'd have to ask him, but I believe Sid at some point in his life will stop acting and will only direct. Uh, I think he, ha he has the soul of a director. And uh, so he was, and he's younger anyway. He had just, you know, he, has, he had tremendous confidence as he went into it. I mean, he might tell you he was, but he, we didn't know that. He, he just seemed to know exactly what he wanted and went after it. and where I sort of felt like I, and I still feel like I'm going, well, uh, well, 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 he just seemed to know what he wanted, so I didn't presume to give either of them advice. Anyway. Well, it, it's really great to be here. I seem to be losing my voice. Um, thank you all, and uh, we'll see a lot more of you, I guess, as the weekend goes on. Get to see everybody one-on-one. -on -one.